he's the key to greatness on this one, apparently. So, um, right, man? Yes, key, sir. Key to greatness. Uh, yes, sir. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to do uh, Stryker Spine Jack. Uh, a couple of words about that is the Spine Jack is an implant technology. It's the second implant next to Kiva. Kiva did a cast trial, 300 patient non inferiority trial, was shown to be non inferior. The pivotal trial for Spine Jack was called the Seiko's trial. It was done 15 sites throughout um, Europe and 141 patients, and they found three superiority claims. I mentioned this previously. Height restoration, uh, pain relief, and less adjacent lo level fractures. And so these are the only three superiority claims in a non-inferiority trial. In fact, these are the only three superior cl superiority claims for the new device over the predicate in 35 years of vertebral augmentation. So if you don't have an interest in this, that's why you should, because it does appear to be a better mousetrap. And we start off with just the typical beveled needle. So this is a beveled uh, 11 gauge needle, and we'll start off. Uh, let's do, let's just do this one, the one right above it, what we did. So this is a typical transpedicular approach centimeter up, two centimeters out, and I am going to make an incision because we'll need that for us. So, knife, please. Sharp. Yep. See, I told you, Matt's stepping up to greatness right there. It was perfect evidence for it. All right, so, and this has a little air on the, on the proximal portion of the needle, the hub, hub of the needle. All right, so we will start here. Thank you. All right. And before we transgress the medial wall of the pedicle, we're going to look to lateral view. We'll exchange this over K wire. And this K wire is not sharp. Some K wires are sharp. This one is blunt. That's not a glove cutter. So I'm going to adjust the trajectory just a here. For those of you, you who haven't done uh, vertebral augmentation before, there's a, did you see the reason why Dr. Beal uh, stopped from going beyond that media line? I think that, that, that big take home message uh, for those of you who've never done it before, I think is, is crucial in, in, for those of you who are just learning. Any takers answer that question here in the audience? Correct. Right. Exactly. I think it, it's something that's quite obvious to want to think about it, but it's, something that's quite important radiologically in seeing that, well, what do I see here? And you see that medial border, that's where you have to stop. So we'll exchange it for a K wire, and we'll go on the other side. Okay. And I'll take a knife again there, please. Thank you. So it's a plunge incision with an 11 or 15 blade needle is all you need. It's not a very big incision. It's not an incision that you have to close with a staple or a suture. So this is a very flat approach, right? This is more of a, a three o'clock position. So. It's more 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock than 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, as we see with the other approaches. And so that is distinctly different. The reason why it's different is because, let's go lateral, we want to push the ski of the spine jack flat up against the end plate. So we want to have this is, um, as flat up against the end plate as we can. If it's compressed top to bottom, anterior wedge compression fracture will cant it a little bit. And so I'll just get past the posterior wall. I can feel the cancellous bone here. All right, and I'm going to direct the tip superiorly a little bit. And we'll go medially. The other tip I like to give my fellows is look at the outside. Look at the trajectory. If you don't like the trajectory on how it's going to the outside to make it symmetric, <coughs> and it is symmetric on the inside, then change the trajectory. So I'm going to change it a little bit like that, and I'm going to exchange this out for a KOR as well. Thank you. 
And we'll do that, having these in place. Let's come back around AP. So I'll take the uh, reamer, and this is uh, truly is a reamer. It looks like a drill. Can you give a close up on that? Uh, see the re reamer a little better? So this looks like a drill. There we go, thank you. But it is not, so it's self-tapping, and the drills, it has a drill configuration, but the, the edges of this are cutting. This is sharp. So you can put this in either by hammering it because this is beveled and has a cutting edge. This is self-tapping at the top, and the, the sides of the threads are sharp. So this is designed to go in both with the drilling motion as well as with the tapping motion. So this, this kind of provides Two, two different aspects of the, the, the device, the tool. All right, so a couple of turns, approximately, it get, gets you past the skin, and we want to flip back laterally. And we're going to monitor the K-wire. I'm going to pull it back so we don't advance the K-wire. If this binds up on you, you can't advance the K-wire through the anterior portion of the vertebral cortex. <coughs> you lose style points for that, so don't do that. Mind the K-wire. Don't, don't let it, don't let it uh, bunge up on you. Sometimes you'll even need to have a coker to get it back. Grab the coker. And once you're in the posterior portion of the vertebral body, like this, you can go ahead and take the K-wire out. I'm just going to leave the K-wire and kind of ride. I like the final position of it. I'm going to ride that thing on down. Ride it on down. And you can make, with the K-wire out, you can have certain directional control over this. This is an aggressive tool enough so where you can have some directional control over it. But you only advance it, so I'm going to, uh, is, uh, you only change directions as you're advancing. So I'm going to pull the inner stylet reamer out of this, leaving the cannula, and I'll take a picture of it with just the cannula. One of the things, uh, um, let's have the plug. I'm going to put an acrylic plug in, but I, I want you to notice the cannula is not in the posterior portion of the vertebral body. For those of us who are experienced with augmentation, that bothers us, but that is exactly where it should be. It shouldn't be all the way in. And I'm going to put this acrylic plug here that plugs the bleeding while we go to work on the other side. So thank you very much. So again with the reamer on the other side and the proximal side to me is plugged so hopefully our cadaver won't bleed to death. So going with the reamer on the other side and that coker the Kelly is fine. Yeah so if it bunges up on you can just take it it's like this, just loosen it up so it doesn't go through the anterior cortex. And very osteoporotic patients, believe it or not, will actually do that, or it can do that. Dr. Bila, how much uh, leeway do you have with that reamer? Um, quite a bit. I mean, this you can really change directions with this sucker. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, as long as you're advancing, you, and especially in osteoporotic patients, this thing really, We'll change directions. And so I'm going to take this out and I'm going to have a, a, a let's have the, the template. This is a template and this is all of these tools are size matched. The reamer, the distance of the threads, this is the octagonal template. It's blunt on the end and it's designed to clear out bone. It goes all the way into the end of it. What I find especially useful is if you want to get close to the anterior portion of the vertebral body, you can tap on this instead of taking the reamer all the way out to the anterior cortex because the reamer is self-tapping and that will sail through the anterior cortex if, if you want it to. So we'll take this out, we'll place the implant. The implant is a single piece of titanium. Uh, it's cut, laser cut from a single piece. It's a scissor jack, effectively, that deploys top to bottom this way, the same direction as the handle from top to bottom. So if you have it deployed like this, the spine jack's going like this. You want to have it deployed from top to bottom 
along that's parallel like that to the vertebral body. And so that's an example of the spine jack. So let's, I'm gonna put, take the acrylic plug out and put another jack in. I want to come up back around to AP if you would. So just one sec, one sec. Can we go back to the actual, uh, the extra spine jack device? We didn't get a good close up look at that. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. So, spine jack has, um, it's cut from a single piece of titanium, they're color coded. The green is 5.8, blue is 5.0 diameters, and the yellow is 4.2, and this is a, a 5.0. And this is titanium jack, it deploys top to bottom this way, the same as the handle. And the butterfly handle here is righty tighty to cause the deployment. And once it's fully deployed, it's um, 13 turns to fully deploy it. And then you unscrew it to take the tension off, and then you unscrew this, the blue knob, which disconnects this, uh, the whole apparatus, and leaves the blocking tube connected to the implant. And the blocking tube delivers cement through the front part of the implant right here where my, the tip of my thumb is. So this is, this is how this is done. Okay. Yeah, can we have a, have a, a uh, while you were going over that, uh, Doug, uh, is the rep have a uh, one that's actually deployed? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Glenn, can you say that one more time? Sorry, uh, does the rep have one that's actually deployed so we can see uh, one that's deployed before we uh, okay, yeah. deploy it in the uh, patient? I'll, I'll deploy one here. Cameron's, Thank you. Cameron's gonna grab it. I'll go ahead and just leave it lateral. That's, well, I'm sorry. Come around back around AP and we'll, we'll check our, our position to make sure we're okay in the AP. And as we're doing that, this one is a deployed example of a deployed jack. So this is one piece. It kind of comes up and opens this way. The skis on the five millimeter are a 19 millimeters in length. This top to bottom is 17 millimeters in height. This is the blocking tube in the center of it. And the hole, whenever this comes out with a blocking tube, it's difficult to see, but the hole where the cement egresses is right here. So kind of in the mid to anterior portion. So it tends to go around the implant first and then it tends to migrate medially in a horseshoe pattern. Um, so good. So the benefits of that, uh, Dr. Beal, of, of where the cement's being deployed would, would be? So we want uh, the cement to kind of be deployed toward the anterior portion. And one of the things that, so I, we like the position of the jacks here. One of the things I'd like to do is maybe come in here a, a little bit. I want to show and widen the field of view up maximally. So drop it. You can't drop it down much, but that may be good enough right there. So I want to show you the, the handles, the bottom of the handles. Maybe what we'll do, just pull it slightly toward you. Or yeah, let's see if we can get bottom. The bottom of the handles are flat. And so one of the things that, we, that I do if I'm unsure about, about where to deploy the spine jack is this flat part right, right here on the, on the bottom of the handle. This Sorry, is, we this missed is, that, that picture of what you're pointing at. Sorry, uh, Doug. This should be parallel to the end plate. That uh, ensures that whenever this is deployed, and I like that. I like that position a lot. This and you deploy it just by by clockwise direction, righty tighty. And we're going to take a look at the partial deployment of this on the AP view. Can we get the AP view over the? Uh, there? Thank you. So good. So this is starting to deploy. And let's flip it back lateral. So we see it coming up right there, and uh, I'm going to deploy the other side. And I'll do it a little bit live as I as I twist. We can see it coming up right there. So we'll deploy this one, and again, it's 13 turns all the way, all full deployment. Deploy this. Deploy this. See it coming up, and you can see how the skis are 
asymmetric. They're bowed a little bit, right? This is a plastic bowing deformity, and this is gives more with the front part of the vertebral body. It tends to open more toward the front part, which is the usual, because that's where the, the vertebral body is needs it the most when fractures. And this, the bowing deformity, is plastic bo bowing deformity that occurs normally. So let's take an AP shot. This is made out of a titanium alloy. This is titanium, aluminum, and vanadium. So it's made out, out of most of the good things, the, the same material as we have most of the titanium implants. So these are, these are fairly typical. So here's, the, you saw the lateral view of them being deployed. This is the anterior, anterior posterior view of the deployed spine jacks. They're wider in the front than they are in the back. And they're kind of right there between the pedicle and the spinous process. And so what we'll do now. So Doug, are you looking at a certain endpoint for the maximum amount of de deployment for the uh, spine jack? So usually I do full deployment. Full deployment on the blue, the 5.0, is 17 millimeters from top to bottom. So if you have a fracture that's reduced, I had a vertebral plane that we did last week. I posted it on LinkedIn. So I encourage all of you guys to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. You'll see a lot of these great cases. And uh, Cameron just mixed up uh, the Vertiplex HV. It comes in an automated mixer that I'd like for him to bring over. It sounds like a power drill. So it's an automated mixer that delivers this high viscosity cement directly to the system here. And so what we're going to do is, as I'm going to unscrew this and then I'm going to unscrew the outer apparatus with the handle. This is about 10 turns to get this off and wherever this comes off, it comes off just like this and the blocking tube stays on the implant, it stays connected through a collar type press fit attachment. So we'll do this on both sides and then we'll fill up the, uh, the cannulas. Each one of these cannulas will hold about two cc's. So let's go ahead and attach that. Good. So I'm going to grab me the other cannula if you would. I'm going to fill this side. I'm going to block the other side. So we'll fill a little bit here. Just flip it back lateral. I want to I want to show you when the cement first comes out because it comes out toward the front part of the implant. So the cement will fill around the implant first and then it will fill toward the center, or tends to fill toward the center. So you can see it coming out of the egress out of the tube right toward the front part of the implant. It's going to start to fill around the implant. Okay. How many CCs have you injected so far? Uh, well, this is, you know, I have to say that. Approximately. That most of the time, this fills not as much in terms of volume as balloon kyphoplasty because the uh, implant, of course, is space occupying and does does take up a certain amount of space. You'll, you'll end up using about two thirds the amount of cement here, as you will, with regular balloon kyphoplasty cases. Oh. Come back around, AP. I'm seeing something go inferior, so we may have a hole in the vertebral body from where I did the uh, previous approach. So let's see what we have going. No, I guess not. Looks yeah. looks okay. So we'll continue to fill a little bit more. What I want to do is fill both sides and I want to join the center. Let's go lateral. So you're not finished until you join from side to side because in poor bone quality the only really Achilles heel of the spine jack is an exceedingly poor bone quality if you don't join the cement from side to side from one implant to the other, occasionally there, there have been rare cases of a breakdown of cement. So this will, will actually uh, break down, the, it can refracture in a, a magral uh, 
you know, A2.1 with a sagittal split between those. That, that only happens with exceedingly poor bone quality, but it can happen. So your end point is where you have enough cement so where it joins in the middle. So I'm gonna put just a little bit more on the other side. And we'll be done. But that looks like a fantastic fill pattern, huh? All right, I really like that. Okay, I start piston back out. Let's see how we're doing. Come, uh, just shoot that once and then come back around to AP, please. All right. So questions from the audience so far. Question here, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when would you use a spine jack over a Yeah, so I thought we were getting a little extravasation. I used that for a previous approach. We're getting a little out the side, but that's good. That's a good fill pattern otherwise. So Doug, a good question from the audience was, when would you use a uh, spine jack versus uh, uh, kyphoplasty? If you uh, really want to reduce the vertebral body. So spine jack has uh, been shown to be better at reduction. Because it's better reduction, probably explains why we get less adjacent level fractures. And so any, any compressed uh, vertebrae that I think can be restored, whether it's chronic with a cleft or whether it's acute or subacute, so I use a combination of anatomy and fracture age. So if fracture age is subacute or acute, spine jack, if it's compressed, um, or if it has a cleft in it, then we'll go ahead and, and use uh, spine jack knowing that the anatomy will lend itself to, um, to reduction. So to be able to take these off, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna pack down the cement. So pack down the cement like this, and then you take the K wire and you feed it through the hole in the cannula. So it has a little hole in the proximal cannula. Feed it through and then twist and pull. You want to be able to twist because a cement has very much of a, a, uh, a resistance to compression, very resistant to compression, but not any resistance to shear. So what this does is this pulls it off. And uh, let's go back lateral. So when we take the implant, the implant is attached to the blocking tube. That's where the cement comes out. The cement can get around the attachment between the blocking tube and the implant. And if you don't twist, then this can adhere. And uh, distraction functionally is the same as compression for cement. So you can take you know, cement like well, a pencil, uh, a tube of of cement and you can just hammer on this and it will not break but if you take it with cement you can just tink it breaks right away so very little resistance to shear a lot of resistance to compression so if you're trying to pull this out if you've got the implant and you're trying to pull the working channel out and you don't twist you can have a lot of distraction and lift the patient off the table it can become adhesed because of that cement so remember two things number one don't panic Number two, twist, and it'll come right <laughs> off. So there, that's a very nice fill with the spine jack. This is, a, this is definitely a, a, a new and better mousetrap. I would encourage you, a comparison of this is the CAST trial. 300 patients compared to balloon kyphoplasty, and it was non-inferior. This is less than half of that size, and it had three superiority claims. So this is something that will definitely improve your practice. Excellent. Other questions? Neil, anything to add, Neil, there? I know you do a spine jack as well. Uh, so Doug is uh, bringing oh, Sorry, that question again, Glenn. Oh, uh, Neil has a few comments to make uh, oh, from yeah. his practice of using spine jack as yes. well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things that Doug and uh, Glenn mentioned is the, uh, for us, Surgeons, it's called the zone of balance. Uh, Control and Display, who are the second members of France uh, to influence this conversation. The first being vertebral plasty, the second being scoliosis treatment. There's a there's a cone of balance uh, that you'll see, and you'll see this in the geriatric patient all the time, because when they come in to see you, 
you'll see that they are uh, leaning forward. And what Doug is talking about, the spine jack's capability, as it expands in the vertebral body, the shoulders effectively shift back over the pelvis. So the expansive nature of the distractive skis is lifting anteriorly <coughs> and shifting you back. And when you shift back, the center of weight of your shoulders is over the center of, uh, of your pelvis, and that relieves the compressive force on your anterior spine. So the effectiveness of the device in reducing the fracture is realigning the patient's shoulders over their pelvis. Now, Doug references that that decreases the refracture rate. And in an osteoporotic patient, the level that you are treating collapsed. Every other single level in the spine has the same osteoporosis. So if they are vertebroplastied in that position and not reduced, or if they are reduced in a more optimal position, your refracture rate goes down. You haven't treated the osteoporosis, that's a separate topic. You've altered the biomechanics of the spine favorably, and that's hugely impactful. So in the subtle comments that Doug is making at about 95 miles an hour, uh, you might have missed that he said the refracture rate decreases. There's a reason for that. It's a biomechanical reason, and the skis are effectively distracting the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is now accordioned from the fracture, expanding it back up and shifting the patient's shoulders back. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. Um, Doug, anything further you wanted to add uh, regarding the uh, procedure itself? No, that's uh, really important. We talk about sagittal balance, and that is the cone of economy, because once you get a certain amount of kyphosis, you can no longer stand without flexing your knees, without having an overarching amount of stress and strain in the rectus spiny. So it's, it's very difficult once you go beyond that, and this really can help uh, reduce that. So people that have a fracture have about a 20 to 25 percent uh, risk of additional or adjacent level fracture after the incident fracture with no treatment. So if that's the case, if you don't treat anybody and you have about 20 to 25 percent risk of additional fracture, how much do you have after vertebroplasty? Not effectively not restoring very much of that height at all. About 20 to 25 percent. The, in the pivotal trial, this was 8 percent. So with spine jack, we're actually able to cut the native incidence of fractures, even from untreated fractures, vertebral uh, fractures. And this, keep in mind, was comparative against bone kyphoplasty. So even against the current gold standard as it was tested back in 2017. So that's it. Uh, anybody have any further Excellent. questions, comments? Other questions, comments from the audience? All right. Oh, well, question here. Go ahead. What's the rate of pulmonary embolisms with all of these procedures? Okay. The question was, uh, what is the rate of pulmonary embolisms uh, with the kyphoplasty or these types of vertebral augmentation procedures? Yeah, so this varies. Uh, the rate of pulmonary embolism varies between five that was reported in CT, uh, yeah, CT follow-ups by an author, Kim, all the way up to 28%. So it's somewhere in the range of 5 to 28 percent. So people see something, pulmonary embolism in the lungs, you see small emboli dots, sometimes more than just a few uh, drops of cement in, in, the, in the lungs. It doesn't really matter in regard to getting extravasation to the lungs insofar as you don't get too much. Anything, again, I've said this before, anything that happens about one in four, one in five times is a normal occurrence. So I'm not saying it's it's advisable to get cement in the lungs. I'm saying it just happens. And it's a, it's a load. You know, we used to have, uh, we used to do declotting back in the days where I used to do interventional radiology. We used to do declotting of fistulograms. So you come in with a fistula and you balloon the venous outflow stenosis. 
and you'd, we'd had this morselization device called the Teratola device, named after our buddy Scott Teratola. And we just kind of stir these. It was like an egg beater for the clot. You'd stir it up, blow, uh, balloon the venous out, flow stenosis, and you'd let the tourniquet go off. And, you know, it, it was uh, kind of unnerving to me because that's a whole tube of blood clot that was going to the lungs. And uh, our... Our guy, the, the director for interventional at the time, this guy's name, that guy named Floyd Osterman, was at Hopkins, and Floyd kind of talked a little bit like Jack Nicholson. He said, yeah, it's not gonna hurt him. Just go ahead and let it go. And, uh, and uh, we did, and it never hurt. So it's not really about clots going to the lungs, it's about the volume. And there's a lot of a volume of clot and marrow that goes to the lungs. That's why we don't do more than about three levels per time. It's not when, when uh, and early in my career, I had a colleague that did a 10 level case and a 12 level case on the same day, both patients died, the two patients deaths one day. And the reason why is they died from pulmonary emboli, from all the marrow fat primarily to the lungs. So just remember, don't extravasate a lot of anything to the lungs, especially cement. And do not freak out and do not worry if you have a good couple of dots of cement in the lungs. It happens about one in four to one in five times. Excellent. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Beal.